Exodus 20, and if you are able, let's stand one more time, this time out of honor of God's word, Exodus chapter number 20. Again, we begin, uh, we began this series on the life of Moses at the beginning of this year, and we have walked with Moses up to Exodus 20, and uh, now we come to the Ten Commandments, and so we are going to take each one of those week after week and study them, and so a little mini-series within the series. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 1. The Bible says, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And here is commandment number one, verse number three. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Would you read that verse with me? Exodus 20, verse three. Ready, set, go. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's the first commandment out of the Ten Commandments. I want to preach this morning on this subject, God alone. God alone. And let's pray. Father, I come to thee again in Christ's name, thanking you that farther along we will know all about it. And that farther along we'll understand why. Lord, there are a lot of question marks in this world. Why Nahum would have this accident, get hurt. Why some of our loved ones were called to home to glory and suffered. But Lord, I thank you in the sweet by and by. We'll understand all of it. And even if we don't always understand here, we trust you. Lord, we thank you for the promise of heaven and the promise of your grace to sustain us in the in-between time. I pray now as we open up the word of God that you would speak to our hearts. Please forgive me of every sin. Fill me. Lord, I just want to be a blessing. I want to be used by you. I pray that you would speak to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Well, I wonder how many of the Ten Commandments can you name? Years ago, a very wealthy man had a camera, and he went downtown to a big city here in the United States of America, and on this camera live, he offered people $20,000 to name the Ten Commandments in 20 seconds. And I want to ask you, could you name the Ten Commandments in 20 seconds? Could you name the Ten Commandments in order? Could you name the Ten Commandments? I, I see that because I imagine this crowd uh, here this morning all of us would say, boy, that's a shame. They've taken the Ten Commandments out of school, and I say amen for that. And it's a shame they've taken Ten Commandments out of court, out of public places, and I say amen to that. The Ten Commandments need to be in those places. But here's what I want to say. The reality is that we gripe because they take the Ten Commandments out of those places, but most of us do not know or live by the Ten Commandments. I mean, we can complain all day long. I tell you, I think the Ten Commandments should be down at the courthouse. But are we living by them in our own lives and in our, home, uh, our own homes? Right. I want to give you some introductory statements as we come to these Ten Commandments. And follow me, this is just introduction. But first of all, the Ten Commandments were not given as a way of salvation. Some people think that they're going to go to heaven if they uh, keep the Ten Commandments. I've knocked on doors through the years and, and uh, asked people, if you were to die today, you know for sure you'd go to heaven. Oh, yes, I know I'd go to heaven. All right, tell me about it. Well, I keep the Ten Commandments. Therefore, I know I'm going to heaven. I want to say to you, friends, no human being can keep the Ten Commandments. It's an impossibility. We're sinners, and we break the Ten Commandments. You say, well, I haven't broken all of them. I've only broken one. But in James chapter 2 and verse 10, the Bible says, if you have broken one commandment, that you have broken all the commandments. You say, I don't understand that, preacher. All right, imagine between right here and the apex of this room, there was a, a, a chain link all the way up to the apex of this roof. Uh, of the ceiling, I should say, if one of those links was broken, the whole chain would be rendered unusable. And God says, if you have broken one commandment, you have broken all of the commandments. Right. The only human being that has never broken the Ten Commandments is the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. And he is not just any human being. He is the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. But every human being apart from Christ has broken the Ten Commandments. Let me just say, again, introduction, that second, the Ten Commandments were given to show us that we are sinners and that we need a Savior. 
They reveal to us the holiness, the righteousness, of the, the purity, the perfection of our great God. They are our schoolmaster to bring us unto God that we might be justified by faith, Galatians 3.24 says. And again, a person is not saved by keeping the commandments. A person is saved by trusting in Jesus Christ alone for his or her salvation. Third, I want to say this, that the Ten Commandments were given on two tables of stone. They were actually given twice. Remember, God gave them the first time, and the children of Israel began to worship a golden calf. Moses got angry, and he threw them down, and so then God wrote them again with the finger of God. But he wrote them on two different tables, and those two tables are very important. The first table signifies our relationship with God. The second table signifies our relationship with one another. For instance, the first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's my relationship with God. Uh, on the second table, we'll come to this, thou shalt not kill. That's my relationship with my fellow man. And Jesus said in Matthew 22 and verse 37 that all of the commandments really boil down to two commandments. The first one is this, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and soul and mind. Because the first commandments all deal with God and loving God. And then the second commandment, Jesus said, the second table is all signified by these words, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I tell you, America would be much better off if we lived by the Ten Commandments. So let's look at this first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Would you mark that word before in your Bible? The word before means above. It means over. It means against the face of God. Thou shalt not have any other gods before or against me. It, it literally means this. We should never bring any God into his presence. We should not put any other gods before his face. If we put it in our term, maybe it would say this. That God should have no rivals in our heart. Right. He is to be the title of my message. God and God alone. There is, by the way, there's only one God. Right. And it is the God of the Bible. Amen. And he wants no rivals. So from verse 3, we can deduct several things. We can deduct this. We should not worship Allah because he is not the God of the Bible. He is not God. Our God is the supreme God. He's the only God that deserves our love. Amen. We should not worship Buddha. We should not worship Mary. You say, well, Mary was the mother of God. Mary was the vehicle by which God used to bring Jesus Christ in this world. But she was a sinner just like all of us who needed a Savior. And we don't pray to Mary or through Mary. We pray to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 2.5 There is one God and there is one mediator between God and men. And that is the man Christ Jesus. We thank God for Mary. and God used her and every woman in our church should look up to Mary. But she is not God. We don't pray to her or through her. We should not worship the Pope, the priest, the pastor, or any other man. You don't have to come to me and confess your sins. You can go straight to God for that. You don't have to come to me and pray to me. Now, if you want to say, preacher, would you please pray with me about this? I would love to pray with you about that. But you can go straight to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. This verse also means, and I know I'm going to meddle here, but we should exclude the Masonic Lodge. Amen. I was studying about that a little this week, and man, it is so blasphemous. The senior officer of the Masonic Lodge is referred to and is dressed as the worshipful master. That's blasphemy, friends. We have one master, and he is the only one worthy of our mercy, uh, of our worship, and his name is the Lord God, and God and God alone. And he is the only one that is worthy of our worship, and he should be the only love of our hearts and our lives. It should be God and God alone. I hear people at different times say, well, God's first place in my life. And I understand what they're saying, but the truth is God should be the only place in your life. Can you imagine if I, if I went to my wife and I said, baby, I love you. Hey. Out of all these lovers, and I have 20 other lovers, you are my first and foremost lover, baby. And she slapped me upside the head. <laughs> Rightly so, right? I mean, she'd be like, I don't want to be the first of many lovers. 
I want to be the only love of your life. By the way, she is. We're a couple weeks away from 20 years, and praise God for that. We're going away for a couple days and cannot wait. God doesn't want to be one of many lovers in our lives. You know, the Hindus, they just add Jesus Christ to all their other gods. We are not pantheists. We don't believe in many gods. We are not polytheists. I'm sorry, polytheists, many gods. We're not pantheists. We don't believe everything's a god. We believe there's one God, and he should be the love of our lives. Amen. One and only. The first commandment, by the way, is the basis of all the other commandments. If I could get the first commandment right in my life, then all the other commandments all fall in place. And so what's the problem? We have killing, we have murdering in America, we have stealing, we have lying, all these commandments that are broken. I tell you, the problem is not all of those commandments as much as it's the first commandment. If we could get God in his rightful place, we won't kill, we won't steal. And so I want to ask you a question. Are you guilty of breaking the first commandment? Am I guilty of breaking the first commandment? Let's look at this. I want to give you three observations about the first commandment uh, this morning. We'll look at it straight from the word of God. Number one, the first observation. Would you write this down? The first commandment begins with a revelation. It begins with a revelation. Most people begin with verse three, but that's not where God begins. They skip over one and two, but look at verse one. And God spake all. These words. Would you underline that in your Bible? I circle the word all. Amen. See, the Ten Commandments begin with this revelation. It is God speaking. Look here. The Ten Commandments did not come from Moses. Well, preacher, I watched this movie and it was called the Ten Commandments and it came from Moses. Oh, that's fine, but they didn't come from Moses. God spoke all these words. They came from Almighty God. Years ago, Ted Turner, who obviously became very famous and owned the Braves and CNN and TBS and TNT and other, play, other stations and so forth. But he, of course, was a God denier. And, and he declared that the Ten Commandments were obsolete. And here's what he said. And I'm going to quote Ted Turner. We are living with outdated rules. The rules we are living under are the Ten Commandments. And I bet nobody even here pays much attention to them because they are so old, too old. When Moses went up on the mountain, they were, uh, there were no nuclear weapons. There was no poverty. Today, the Ten Commandments would not go over. Nobody around here likes to be commanded. Commandments are out. End quote. I don't know about you. I have a problem with that quote. Amen. Amen. The Ten Commandments are not outdated because God's word is timeless, not trendy. And the Ten Commandments did not originate with Moses. The Ten Commandments originated with God. And they are not the Ten Suggestions for our lives. They are the Ten Commandments that God gives to us. God, look at that, verse 1. God, remember the Bible is the revelation of God to us. God. We studied that on Wednesday night. The name God means Elohim. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God, Elohim. Do you know what the name God means? Elohim. It means the strong one, the mighty one. So this is not Moses giving us these ten commandments. This is not just a, another man or even a preacher. This is God, Elohim, the strong one, the mighty one, who has given us these ten commandments. Notice, God spake. He did not stutter. He did not stammer. He spake. And then I circle that word, all these words. We should obey every commandment because God spoke all of them. Boy, some people pick and choose. Well, I am not going to kill. I'm not going to break the Ten Commandments. But the same people take God's name in vain. Well, you can't. If you break one, you broke them all. I'll tell you one thing, for me, I'm never going to steal. Thou shalt not steal. And that's great. We should do that. But the same teenager that says that doesn't honor his father and mother. Well, wait a second. God didn't speak some of them. God, Elohim, the strong one, the mighty one, he spoke all these words. And we are to obey all 
of the Ten Commandments. I love it because it all begins, the whole chapter begins with God. I've been saying this over and over again, but the study of God is called theology. And systematic theology is so important because if I'm going to have the right relationship with man, which is anthropology, I must first have the right fellowship with God, which is theology. Everything begins with my view of God. And if I view him as a perfect, holy God, and I want to obey him, that helps me with my interpersonal relationships with other people. And so number one, the first commandment begins with a revelation. It begins with God. Number two, the first commandment continues with a relationship. Number one, a revelation. Number two, a relationship. Would you look at verse two? I am. Remember, he gave that name to Moses in Exodus 3. If you were with us, we studied that. Moses said, when I get down to Egypt, who should I tell him sent me? And God said, I tell you, give him this name. I am that I am. Remember, that's the name Jehovah God. It was the, it was the personal name of God. There was a relationship. It means he's self-existing. No one created God. There was a day when the when the heavens were created, there was a day when I was created, there was a day when the fish were created, the day when the fowls were created. There was never a day when God was created. He is eternal. He is self-existing. He's the great I am. I am the Lord, and I circle this word in my Bible, thy God. There's a relationship here. Which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Again, God could have revealed himself in any name, but he revealed himself as the I am. And he said, I am thy God. I am your God. That phrase, thy God, is repeated five times throughout the Ten Commandments. And he's to reminding the children of Israel, I'm your God. There's a personal relationship. He's reminding them of, of, their, of his authority. Do you know, all of us, I'm looking about, there was a day when all of us were created. And we were created by Almighty God. You are not an accident. God created you. You did not evolve. God created you. For many of us, maybe most of us in this room, I don't know all of us. There was a day not only when God created us, but God redeemed us. I like that, that word, I have brought thee out of land to be. There was a day when God saved us. He redeemed us. He brought us out of that bondage. So for those of us who are saved, we belong to the Lord twice, don't we? Amen. We were created by God and we were redeemed by God. May 1st, 1978, really it began with conception, but that was the day I was born. God created me. Write that down, May 1st, so you can remember to, you know, <laughs> cards, gift cards, to Krispy Kreme donuts. You know. But then years later, July 21st, the Lord saved me. Amen. I'm twice his. If you're saved, you're twice his. Amen. So these commandments take on an extra special element for those of us who are saved because not only did he create us, he is the Lord, our God. I don't tell Michael Cook or Judy Yang or Avery Fields. I mention them because they're the same age as Andrew. They're all within just a few uh, months apart. I don't tell them to clean their rooms. They probably need to sometimes, but I do tell my boy Andrew to clean his room. And if he doesn't, there are consequences, right? Why? I'm his dad, and he's to obey his dad. How many of us say, oh, he's my God, and then we break his commandment? You see, it begins with a revelation. This is God speaking. It continues with the relationship. This is not just any God. He is the Lord, my God. And then number three, the first commandment ends with a requirement. So verse one is the revelation. Verse two is the relationship. Verse three is the, the requirement. And here it is. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I like what one person said. He said the top of the Ten Commandments, you can write one word. Don't. Don't have any other gods. He's to be the only love of our life. He is to be God alone. 
Could I say anything or anyone we fear, love, or serve more than God has become a God in our lives? And there are always gods that compete for our love and our loyalty. Let me just mention a few. I could mention many others. And I'm going to try to mention the ones in America. Say, well, I don't have Molech, or I don't have Baal, or I don't have Ashtaroth. Okay, what about these gods? The God of pleasure. Paul was writing Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 at the end of Paul's life. He wrote, of course, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 4, Paul said this, that in the last days, here's one of the characteristics, men shall be lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. America is guilty of breaking the first commandment. We are a nation filled with pleasure seekers. And pleasure lovers. And the God of pleasures has taken control of our country and our churches and our homes and our families. And, and we have broken the first commandment. Say, prove it, preacher. All right, Sunday has become the day to miss church. Run to ball fields and campgrounds and amusement parks. The day to go shopping. The day to go swimming. The day to go to the flea market. I mean, it's the day to do everything other than to give God the day. Could I remind you, according to the Bible, Sunday is called the Lord's Day. Right. Yet how many America have made it my day instead of his day? Come on now. Recreation is not bad. Vacations are not wrong. Playing sports, I love to play sports. Those things aren't bad. But if those things take the place of God, then I have broken the first commandment. So let me just enumerate. You should not miss church to hunt or to fish. Right. Nothing wrong with hunting. How many of you enjoy hunting? Nothing wrong with fishing. How many of you enjoy fishing? All right. I was visiting yesterday, and this dad was telling me, he's like, I bought two fishing bowls for my boys, and, man, I can't wait to get out there to, to uh, Wilson Creek and go fishing with my boys. And that's great, unless you do it on Sunday. Right. And now you have said, this is more important than the Lord in his day. Should not miss church to go to a ball game. Should not miss church to watch a ball game. It's the Lord's day. I need to be in the Lord's house. I love ball games. Andrew's playing baseball and uh, county baseball there and for 9 and 10. Of course, he just turned 9 and his team went undefeated. And boy, we had so many fun nights over there at the ballpark. And uh, we played all the other teams in the county, and our team beat all of them. And the other night, Thursday night, we were playing under the lights, and man, it was so much fun. And uh, we were winning, and Andrew hit the ball into right field and ran around all the bases and got a, got a home run. And that run uh, finished the game off, and man, we were all cheering and celebrating. It was great. I love it. Brother Dave and I, we always talk about, I love baseball, but I know this. My boy's not playing baseball on Sunday. Right? Not playing baseball, doing travel ball, and missing God's house. How many of you like to camp? Like going camping? All right, a few of you. That's not my thing, okay? I pay my mortgage. I want to sleep in my bed where it's 72 degrees. I'm too much of a wimp to go out there, all right? I like when I wake up in the middle of the night where I can go to my bathroom and flush that toilet or go to my kitchen and get a snack or a drink, you know, but some people like camping. I'm not knocking that. I'm just saying if you do camping on Sunday morning when you should be in God's house, broken the first commandment. Any ungodly people here like to shop? <laughs> Man, can I get a witness? Don't you get more tired shopping than you do if you ran a marathon? I mean, what is up with that? Wife and I are going to go, this is still a few weeks away, for our anniversary, out of town for a few days, and I know we'll probably do some shopping. She's not the biggest shopping fan in the world, but she likes to do it here and there. Here's how a lady does it. You know, you go in that first store, and you're trying to be a good husband, patient, and then you go to the second, and she sees something. Then you go to the second store, third store, fourth store. Inevitably, they always come by, back and buy what they saw in the first store. If you're like I am, 
I know what I'm going for. I go in there. I get it. And, buddy, I'm out of there so fast. And you all probably think I'm unkind for this. And if I can skip even going through the line, I do that. I mean, self pay or what? I mean, I'm getting out of there. I'm in there and out of there, you know. Shopping's not wrong in and of itself, I think. But I tell you, if you do it on the Lord's Day, then it's become breaking the first commandment. We have some of our folks that are on vacation today, and I want our church people to go on vacation. We have quite a few families that are out today. I want you to go on vacation. I want you to have those memories with your family, but. Don't skip God's house and God's word. Have your devotions while you're on vacation. I'm just saying, if we love pleasures more than we love God, then we have broken the first commandment. Let me give you another God. Again, this is under the requirement. There's a God of pleasure. There's a God of prosperity in America. I doubt any of us have a fat Buddha sitting in our house. But what about the God of prosperity? 1 Timothy 6.10, for the love of money is the root of all evil. And America is guilty of breaking the first commandment. We become a nation of prosperity lovers. Money's not wrong itself. The Bible doesn't say money is the root of all evil, but it's the love of money. And when love of money captures my heart above God, then I have broken the first commandment. If I think about making money more than I think about God, then I have broken the first commandment. If I take what belongs to God and use it for myself, I've broken the first commandment. Let me hasten on. Here's another God. Again, this requirement, thou shalt know the God before me, the God of pleasure and the God of prosperity. And, and what about the God of popularity? Boy, that's a God in America. 2 Timothy 4.10, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. America is guilty of breaking the first commandment. We are guilty of being popularity lovers. Don't believe me? Then why are people so obsessed with how many likes they get? How many followers they have? You won't believe how many views I got on this video. I'm not saying those things are wrong, but I'm telling you, if you crave that love and that, uh, crave that attention, I should say, beware, you can break the first commandment. America has become American Idol, hasn't it? I love Pat Riley. He used to call it the me disease. America has the me disease. <laughs> we were, Andrew and I went to a ball game the other day, and, you know, we're standing in line to get a hot dog. And while we're standing in line to get a hot dog, the guy right, I mean, we're getting a hot dog for Pete's sake. Paying seven bucks for a hot dog. <laughs> the guy in front of me. I'm like, you're taking a selfie in a hot dog line? What a weenie, right? No. I mean, we are obsessed with ourselves. And I'm saying, if you love fame more than you love God, you have broken the first commandment. I tell you, your business can become your God. Your career can become your God. Your social status can become your God. Your vehicle can become your God. I remember asking a guy one time, he had a nice vehicle, and this was in Pennsylvania, and we had someone that came to our church that didn't always smell the best. I don't know that they always used deodorant, and, but they needed a ride, and so I asked this guy, and he had a nice car, had a convertible, hey, would you be willing to take this person home? And uh, the guy was a good guy, but I remember him being like, oh, I don't know. And I knew what it was. He didn't want that stinky person in his nice car. Man, I tell you, if that's the case, that car has become a God in your life. If my, God, if my car is so valuable to me that I'm not willing to pick up someone and have them and take them home, then I am worshiping that car. What about this? Your children can become your God. I don't want... I, I gotta be careful. I want God's will for my children. Right. Yeah. And if it's my will, not my kid, my kid's not going to Africa to be a missionary. Well, wait a second. Your kids now have become God in your life. Yeah. I think there are two tests to see if we have any other gods before the Lord our God. There's the love test. What or whom do I love the most? 
Thomas Watson said, to love anything or anyone more than God is to make a God, small g. And then there's the trust test. What or whom do I trust the most? Martin Luther said, whatever thy heart clings to and relies upon, that has become thy God, small g. And that's convicting, isn't it? I read a story where a man purchased a statue of Jesus Christ. By the way, I'll get to this on the next commandment, but you should never have a statue of Jesus Christ. I don't believe you should even have a, a picture of a crucifix of Christ on the wall. He's not on the cross. He's a rose from the grave. But this guy bought a statue of Christ, and as a man does, he thought, oh, this is a pretty nice thing, and he put it in his living room. Well, his wife came along, and she thought it belonged in a different room. How many men know what we're talking about right there, right? How many men know you just let the wife get her way on that one? And so as she was moving it to a different room, this statue of Christ, the five-year-old daughter saw her mom moving the statue, and here's what the five-year-old daughter blurted out. Mom, where are you going to put God? That's a pretty good question for all of us. Where are you going to put God in your life? Because for many people, they stack him down at the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> Brother Mike and I talk about this. Teenagers, we love you, but we have some teens, if I don't have anything else going on on Sunday, then I'll go to church. You have stacked God down. You have broken the first commandment. Yes, sir. That in all things, he might have preeminence, Colossians 1.18. He is not to be stacked at the bottom, and he's not just to be the top of other lovers. He is to be God and God alone in my life. That's the first commandment. Let me ask you a few questions this morning. Number one, are you trying to keep the Ten Commandments to get to heaven? Because first of all, you cannot. And secondly, even if you could, it wouldn't save you. Because we don't get to heaven by our works. We get to heaven by the finished work of Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's right. Amen. Number two, are you guilty of breaking the Ten Commandments? And in particular, are you guilty of breaking the First Commandment? Well, preacher, you can come to my house. I, I, I don't pray to Allah seven times a day. I don't face Mecca and Medina and bow down and pray. Maybe you don't have Allah, but again, what about the God of money? or the God of my children, or the God of my pleasure, whatever it may be. Number three, I ask you, do you have other gods before the Lord thy God? And I have to examine my heart and see my love, my trust, my time. Who is the real God in my life? Because God spake all these words and said, I am the Lord thy God. And thou shalt have no other gods before me. Oh, may the Lord help us. Father.